Adam, cheers for your time, mate. It's going to be great to hear about your technology journey and your journey in this industry. And it's going to be a bit different to the other guys, right? Because you've, you've progressed from sales roles into C-level roles within organizations, growing them and then selling them on and all those kind of areas. So it's going to be a very different conversation. So as a starting point, can you just introduce yourself and let everyone know who you are, what you do, and why they should watch this video? Yeah, well, thank you for um, asking me to do this, Kyle. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to take part in this initiative. I think it's a great idea that you've, um, you, you've um, come up with here. And again, the effort that you're putting in, the people that you're speaking to, I think um, it's, it's a great opportunity for people to pick up some free wisdom, some um, learn the lessons, let's say, that people like myself um, uh, didn't have the opportunity to learn right at the beginning. Um, my name is Adam Jarvis. Um, I've been in the IT sector now for almost 30 years, not quite, um, 29 uh, years. So that makes me feel really, really old. It really does. Um, I, I joined um, at the back end of the, let's call it the PC era. So, um, I mean, again, I was having this conversation re recently. People were selling PCs for 10 to 15,000 pounds a unit. You were making five, six, seven grand margin, and you could not line the articulated lorries up quick enough. That's how fast they were flying out the door. But I, I, I joined the IT industry as, as sort of that PC revolution. You know, mainframes were just starting to fade out. Um, and uh, obviously, PCs are proliferated and and uh, they were they're just starting to come come towards an end but uh but yeah no i've been in in all areas of of it i've worked for the largest um business by market cap uh i've worked in smes around 150 well, let's say 50 to 150 employees um i've worked in startups with four to five people and i've worked in corporate land with the likes of capita um so I've, 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 in, in terms of technology i've been across networking uh, data center uh all, all different aspects unified communications telecoms um I, i've been around the block i think is, is probably the, uh, yeah, the phrase the, uh, it might be uh, the stars, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah but so if you think about like where you started out then and yep how's that career kind of navigated so obviously you started out in a role and then saw an opportunity yeah, yeah. and taking it and then progressed from there so how did that kind of pan out yes yeah, a great question finish university um tried to start looking for a job thought well it's it's sales um uh didn't you know uh necessarily want a career in sales but obviously the money was really really attractive got a call off a friend um he'd taken a job that gave him a company car uh, and that was his uh, you know uh, motivation in life at that point um but said a friend of his had offered him a job in it um and he turned it down was i interested um went to talk to the business it was a, a unix software business uh, sco santa cruz operation unix um we were selling into um medical supplies uh, application providers like aah medital building systems for doctors and, and uh, hospitals and things like that um i joined i can tell you right now on a six and a half thousand pound basic salary um as a telesales operative of a team of uh, eight telesales four external one sales manager one sales director and uh, Lee Hawksley um, was my sales manager. He was ruthless, uh, to say the least. Um, if he ever walked in the office and the phone wasn't in your ear, and obviously we had, uh, we didn't have these, yeah. uh, we had these, um, then you would be bollocked uh, beyond, you know, comprehension of life itself. <laughs> um, we had a, a no CRM systems. We had a, a desk-based card system. And you started at the front, you know, it was Kyle Davis, you, you knew what he liked, you knew he liked motorbikes, you knew he did this, he did that, he's got a son, you wrote that on your card and off you went, you phoned Kyle and you made some notes and that went to the back of your file and you started on the next card. Um, hard yards, Kyle, but I have to say, um, I, I learned some, some brilliant 
lessons in that team, um, the people that I work with, uh, which we'll possibly talk about shortly, um, you know, were absolutely second to none, you know, from uh, one of the things that you learn about this industry is when you're in a tight knit unit of people pulling in the same, same, uh, same direction, it's amazing what you can achieve. And, and, and that team there that I, uh, uh, I work with were, were fantastic. And, um, you know, certainly one of them, oh, well, um, a number of them I'm still very much in touch with right now. Yeah, perfect. And so when we moved on from there, because I know, I know I joined and I met up with you when we were at Intrinsic, right? Yep. So, so what was the journey to Intrinsic? And because I know that you were at Intrinsic before the guy that owned it sold out, right? And then you took on the management position there. Yeah, no, no. Um, sorry, sorry. Uh, I, th I think the first thing to, to say about my career, which is interesting when you reflect on it, is, um, uh, you know, I was... Um, offered roles and positions uh, or I have been all the way through my career I've, I've never stopped uh, within my career and thought right um, I'm here today and this is the job that I want tomorrow um, all from even from uh, that time that I've just explained at, at Sphinx level five I got a phone call um, from a chap who said is that Adam I said yeah he said um, will you come and meet me in a motorway service station <laughs> that's an offer you can't refuse uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure about that um, but he explained why I, I met the guy and it turned out he was a, um, a, a headhunter term I didn't really understand what that meant um, from a company called Technology PLC which again at the time was the largest value added reseller um, computer centre and an SCC were you know sort of second third and fourth obviously you know a CDW or a Kelway you know they just didn't exist um, but, um, yeah, TPLC said, why don't you come and work for me? I'll increase your salary exponentially, the, the big lights. And, and really from that point, Carl, that's pretty much what's happened on a number of occasions. Um, so I, I got a phone call from Alan when, when Intrinsic was, was, a, was a, a million pound business and, um, it was, it had got itself up and running. Um, it was relatively one dimensional. It was, it was networks and, and sort of break fix maintenance. Um, but it was, it had a, a, you know, it had a sales team that was incredibly proactive. Um, so it had the constituent elements. Um, you know, I pitched a, a way forward to Alan, you know, at that point in the technology cycle, IP telephony convergence was happening. Mm -hmm. Said we needed to move in that direction. We went for it and, and, and then we just grew the business from a million to 39.7, didn't quite tip the 40. Um, now, a point in that journey, um, what I realized in the sales team, and, and we had an absolutely brilliant unit, you know, people like yourself, obviously, were a part of that. Uh, again, back to having that tight knit team of people all pulling in the same direction, you know, we, we, we really created momentum. Um, but it, it dawned on me that, you know, there, there was um, very little, if anything, that I could do or we could do to improve the performance of the sales team. We were, we were operating as well as we could operate. In, in, and in fact, it was the rest of the business that was holding us back, not negatively, but it, you know, it hadn't developed at the pace that we developed. So, sorry, I'm, what I meant is that they weren't doing anything wrong, but they could have done things better if that made, made sense. Yeah. Um, you know, um, uh, again, we, we, we still face that scenario and I'm sure you, everyone will have a story along these lines where we'd dispatch the engineer um, to a customer and he'd, you know, he'd walk in and he'd say, Christ almighty, you put that network in, it's a disgrace. And the, uh, the customer would say, well, you did. Uh, so <laughs> we're, on that, we're on that basis, get straight out of that door and get your boss to phone me. You know, and, and um, customer service and, and sort of the bigger picture and white space and growing and cross selling all these different things, you know, it, it it didn't really pervade all the way through the through the organization. So when the opportunity to become CEO came along, I, I grabbed it with both hands because you know what I saw was the opportunity to take what we'd created in sales and sort of pass that and and, and expand that across other areas of the business, other departments. Um, you know, and and, and to sort of be um, I don't know, sort of simplistic about it, you know if you've got Mavis in accounts or Fred in accounts that are doing credit control, 
you know, that's not an easy conversation that you have with people, but but there is a way that you can have that conversation and there's a way that you conduct yourself that that is um, more positive and it uh, generates relationships with people that they simply don't forget. And it's then not actually just all about price. It is actually about the service and the, the, the much broader um, relationships that we have across different areas of the of the two businesses. You know, people talk about partnership. Yeah, it's a big word. We all use it and yada, yada, yada. But that's, you know, partnerships when Fred in accounts gets on with his counterpart and they've, they've you know, they've negotiated a, a, a way of communicating, a way of, you know, transferring cash at the right and positive time. And, and what his counterpart does in, in finance is goes to her counterparts in IT or business or sales and says, you know what, that lot intrinsic, they're really, really good. Now, if that's coming from all different areas within a customer, that's when you've got a, a mm-hmm. partnership because everybody thinks, you know, you're really, you know, you're a really good organization to work with. So that took me into the role of CEO. Yeah. And um, I know that my time there was, it was great. Right? We were doing lots of things. We were trying to build new cloud platforms. We were looking at diversifying product sets, taking new go to markets and all those kind of things. And for me, for the time that I was at Intrins, I thought it was, from a learning point of view, it was fantastic, right? Because there were so many things that we were trying to do as a business. And because we were kind of uh, venture capitalists kind of bought into as well, there was kind of a return that we had to get our, our commercial heads in the right space for as well, because we need to make sure everyone got their money back at some point, right? Um, the, yeah. And that's, and that for me was where the commercial element of my career today really started to be formed. Because I think before that, being brutally honest, I was a techie and a techie through and through. And yeah, yeah. You give me a spanner and you give me a screwdriver or some code or whatever, and I go in and do whatever I need to do. But the bit that I then started to learn from my point in my career was how that relates to the business outcome and the commercial impact. Yeah. Whilst I was at Intrinsic, I didn't get that before. That was definitely for sure. Yeah, yeah, no. Again, it's it, it, you know, it's a it's a very important lesson for let's say technically orientated people to understand, and and I guess there's two sides to it in the way that you just explained it. You know, um, the, the 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 sort of the first and simplistic way is that when you're a PE or or even a uh, you know a shareholder owned business, there is a relentless pressure on achieving the uh, the business plan and the performance, and of course. You know, as a management team, you pull a business plan to, together that you believe you can achieve. And, um, you know, we, we did that year on year, year after year in, in Trinsic. So, you know, in that respect, everybody, uh, you know, understood what they needed to do and, and got that done. But I think through through my experience of now working with, you know, really good pre-sales people and, and, and really good consultants, um, and, and, and we talk about this adage all of the time, don't we? You know, building a Rolls Royce, I think is the way that we say it. You know, c- customers have um, challenges, they have constraints. You know, households have budgets and constraints. You know, we'd all love to have a Ferrari on the drive to get us from A to B, but that's just not realistic, is it? Um, but equally, what I don't want is an old jalopy that's falling apart, that's unreliable, that will, you know, set off, but it'll break down halfway before I get to be. So, you know, we need to, a solution that ticks as many of the, it obviously it achieves what the customer wants it to achieve in terms of the set of deliverables. But of course, above the deliverables, there's also the features and the added and the benefits that, that the customer's looking for. And if we can get as high up that list as we possibly can while maintaining the cost at a level that's happy for the that's acceptable for the customer that's when you strike gold you know you you, you're delivering at a price point that the customer's comfortable with but you've achieved the technical and and the and the and the outcome or the business benefits you know you're well up the stack of lists and of course you can never get to the top because the you know the nearer you are to the top, the price has to go inevitably, and, and, and you go beyond the point with which your solution is then competitive with, with with other people. Now, a pre-sales person or a consultant that understands that dynamic, getting the most return and benefit for the book, you know the the, the best return for for, for 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 investment, they are worth their weight in gold. And um, it, it, it's, and, and I say that as if it's easy, it's not easy, you know, that's a very difficult mm-hmm. sort of, um, 
it's a two mindsets to to to, to blend into one. Um, but you're right. You know, we, we had some good ones, and again, um, and uh, you know, I've been blessed with 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 knowing a few of those through my career. But I think with yourself, you know, you grasped that concept quicker, I think, than anybody that I've seen grasp it before. You know, and and to a certain extent, as I remember, you know, you almost flipped the other way, and then you came back to the perfect equilibrium. You know, it, and it, it's but it's not easy, Kyle. It's not easy. It really isn't. Uh, uh, but no, it, but it's it is very, um, it's very common. Like even even now, we see it where very very good technically astute people that become commercially aware and business aware, they sit there and they think, well, actually, I'm going to move into sales because they earn more money than me and they do less work. Like that's what the technical person in their mind says, and then they go over to that side of the fence and they sit there and they just the in most cases, not all cases, in most cases they fail because it's not as easy as they thought. It's not all the the, the wine and the dining, the entertainment, the making sure the customer's happy. It's that also the back office admin element of that customer wants a printer toner on Monday morning. You make sure you've got a printer toner on for them on Monday morning. Yeah, so yeah, that is the yeah. most important thing to them, right? And it's, it's those kind of things that I think a lot of technical people that love working with tech completely forget from a sales point of view. It's not just about the tech. It could be a keyboard, a mouse. It could be something very mundane and very basic yeah. that you're dealing with that someone's shouting at you about and there's absolutely nothing you can do. We take the current pandemic we're in, supply chain challenges with various vendors, and there's nothing you can do and you're getting constant complaint. And there's zero you can do. Yeah, I, I would concur with that. I, I mean, I'd um, if, if, it, if it just take it to a slightly higher level, I, I think the um, what I see with uh, technical people who become salespeople is, um, that the brilliant in the middle, but there's a there's a beginning and an end, which is really going along with what you said. You know, they're not that great at opening the door. And if I can be controversial, of course, it isn't a broad bush for everybody, but in general, they're not often that good at listening or qualifying and probing with the right questions. Because, you know, in that qualification phase, which a good and proper professional salesperson does, listening to the customer requirement instead of saying look i've got this solution and, and it's what you want it's perfect it's perfect you know well actually is it what the customer wants you have to understand that intimately and then you can arrive at the right solution now when you've got that qualification at that point technical salespeople or technical people who become salespeople are brilliant you know because they have the passion around technology they can articulate the solution with real um you know with a real difference of, of like say passion um and, but then of course you've got the back end which is then um closing the deal negotiating and sometimes Contracts. being pretty pretty difficult you know and hard nose with people and and again invariably that's where you know technical people um you know, t- tend to not be as as direct but but in in general and, and again, back to your point, I've seen some fantastic um, people, uh, salespeople who've previously been technically orientated. Yeah, definitely. And so what and, would you I, say- I, might, I might add to that point, by the way. Yeah. Um, you know, salespeople equally have multiple deficiencies where they're not so good. <laughs> so let's not, you know, let's make not let's not make out out and out salespeople are perfect, and uh, you know, technical turning to salespeople are, 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 are not so. It, it, you know, no, I can I can definitely agree with that statement, and I think um, the same on the technical side of the fence, right? Everyone's got a different persona and and the way they work and all that kind of stuff, and that's always the challenge is marrying those people together in the right way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so if we think about your creative what's the most memorable moment that you've had yeah memorable moment wow that's that, that's a tricky one um but i mean i have to i have to say um i mean of course when we went on to sell the intrinsic business which had been you know a real uh journey for so many people you know it took so much out of you emotionally physically um so to reach the end of that journey that that was that was something um Incredible, but I, I, I think um, you know when you're in a, an organisation that's growing and it's transforming and it's you know it, 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 it's you know really going. It's got a trajectory that's heading uh, upwards. That there are there are stages that, that that come along that you know where step change achieve, step change is achieved. And I think 
um, you know, through that journey, you, you know, that that's generally um, uh, signified by maybe uh, particular customer wins. Um, you know, for example, you know, if you're a small business and, and you're under a million pounds and you're taking orders for 10K or maybe you get up to 50K, who knows? You know, if someone said to you, well, you're going to win an order for a million pounds, you know, one order, one million pounds, they say, oh, it's impossible, that's never going to happen. So, you know, I do remember through our time with Intrinsic that we, you know, we had those sort of real um, uh, sort of signature deals that, that you could feel the organisation lurch in a real different direction and you know the, the the sort of satisfaction that it gave you in terms of what what you've just achieved at that moment mm. in time um and and i think if i if i really reflect we um th there's a there's a couple of deals that that, that that spring to mind barclays united utilities which were game changers for us but um the one that really steps to mind was um, was was co-op. We did a deal with the co-op, and um, again we were competing. You know, we were at that point probably a 35, 30 million pound organisation. No, probably about thirty five. We were at the time. It was one of the final years, um, but we were dealing with the likes of IBM. We're a competitor. You know, huge billion dollar organisations. Um, and uh, we'd really got into the sort of war room uh, mentality. And we'd actually physically got a room now that we call the war room instead of it just being someone's office. Um, and we all got in this, this uh, room. We were on the final uh, strokes to the deal. And, um, you know, we're trying to come up with what we could do, you know, and we, obviously we, we were desperately trying to avoid price. You know, we'd, disc we'd gone through a round of discount. We'd done another round of discount. We'd thrown the 50Ps in. You know, it, it wasn't price. We couldn't do that. And we had to really, really try and think, you know, what we could do. Um, and, and, we, and we came up with this idea, which was to place a sort of trusted um, a CCIE engineer on site for three days a week, um, which we wrapped up into a sort of a proposition that was costing us £100,000. But it gave them a dedicated CCIE, which at the time was a, was a big old, um, you know, accreditation. I'm not saying it is now, but it was... You know, at that point it was huge um and we and we threw it out there and we you know we, we thought we were clutching at straws and we thought oh, oh crap we're just not going to win this anyway uh you know needless to say a week later we, we we knocked the deal over and and of course that um how can i say sort of provocative initiative as we deemed it at the time you know the individual who we put on site became like a blood brother to the to everybody on the sh it shop floor and of course it was like a, it, at that point it was like a funnel you know uh, we don't know how to you know the vending machine's not working we'll get andy to fix it and he goes and fix it and so you need a new vending machine well where do i get one of those intrinsic and we just <laughs> you know it became a, a you know a waterfall of a relationship at that point so i think you know um in summary it was a you, you you, you, it was one of those scenarios where you tested, um, you know, everyone has to really put the, the brains together. You, you're really unsure about what you've done, but then you have that sort of, again, step change sort of um, piece of business that you feel, you tangibly feel the organization change as you, as you yeah. move up the ladder. Um, I think that's maybe, a, a, again, an example I'd give you. Yeah, I think they're great memorable moments, right? And I think that it's that it is that feeling that it gives you and the people around that that makes it more memorable. Yeah. And if we think about the mistakes we make along the way, right? We, we always make mistakes, and we always hope to learn from them and never make the same mistakes again. Um, but what would you say was the one of the biggest mistakes you made and the greatest lesson you learned from it? Yeah. Um... I think one of the regrets that I have in life, I guess, if in, if that's the right uh, thing to say, but certainly in the workplace is, it, you know, it, it's people, it's it's dealing with people. And um, that's the biggest and most rewarding thing about what we do or any manager does. Um, but equally, it's the hardest thing to do as well, because everybody's different. Everybody has different motivations. Um you know, there's no way that you can be a success without trusting people, without taking risks, without giving people responsibility. Um, and of course, you just you trust your judgment to um, 
uh, pick the right people to do the right jobs. Um, now, again, uh, and something that I've always said throughout my career is, you know, Alex Ferguson, um, you know, made seven really good signings out of 10, but, you know, he made three absolute terrible signings um, that, uh, you know, that everybody would look at and think, oh, you know, Christ almighty, who's made that signing? But the one thing that Ferguson always did when he made a bad signing or, um, you know, someone within the team was upsetting the team balance, he acted quickly and he acted decisively and he removed that element and he just binned them, you know, as quickly as could be. Because what he knew was the team was, you know, that was the, the, the most important thing. So I think probably the thing that I'd, I'd, I'd say to you, Kyle, is that, um, you know, I've trusted many, many hundreds of people, you know, in, in many different jobs, but I've trusted many, many people. And I think um, there are occasions that I can recognize where when people are letting you down, um, you hope and you pray and want and try to get them to turn that scenario around, even though oh, deep down, you know, they're probably not going to do um, and I think um, what you learn as you get older is you need to therefore react quicker and you need to um, take that decision that can be seen as really difficult at the time, um, uh, but it's the best decision for the team in the long run. Um, and, and I certainly on reflection, you know, I've let things go on for too long, uh, you know, when, when I knew it wasn't the right thing to do and, and should have maybe acted more decisively quicker. Yeah, so definitely. that's people, you know, it's difficult. It's not easy. You know, um, it, it really is. Uh, uh, it, it's the essence of, as I say, management. If you if you or if you got that right all of the time, every time you, you would be, you know, someone incredible. You'd be doing very well. Yeah. And I've taken on a, a management role earlier this year um, and then COVID hit. Right. Which then try to learn to become a, a, a manager <laughs> and a people person and emotional intelligence and all that kind of stuff. Right. And then put all that into a virtual yeah. landscape with these things, and it, yeah, it's definitely going to be a learning curve. It's going to shape my career moving forward, that's for sure. Um, yeah. Well, all I can, all I can say is again, the lesson I would pass on is, you know, I mean, again, I'm the kind of person I'm, sh I'm sure you're the same who just doesn't want to give up. You think you can you can turn a situation, and 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 you know, many many times you can, but when you know something's not right and it's absolutely inside. Uh, you got you need to act decisively and act quickly and not let it drag on yeah definitely and if on that kind of note of like tips right if um if you were looking back at yourself uh, many years ago and you're going to give yourself three tips coming into the industry what what would that be yeah no i, th I thought it's a, it's a good question that i thought about this uh, and it, you know it, it's um it, it, it's a bit like saying what's your favorite song because uh, depending on what mood you're in you know dictates what your favorite song is isn't it and of course you could have 20 favorite songs but um but no i'll put, I'll put some thought to this um so so i think the i think the first thing i would say is is is, is be the whether it's be the best you can be or be the best at what you do right and and, and what i mean by that is it it, it it's it's basics and it's and it and it's quality. And I'll, I'll start by telling you a story. Again, another fairly formative uh, individual within my career. Um, but I again, I remember going to a meeting with a senior decision maker, and I walked through the door, um, and I'd um, you know, I got a, a really I'd made sure my collar, my shirt was ironed to perfection, and I'd, I'd, I'd you know taking time in the car park to make sure the tie. Was meticulous you know not open not not down it was meticulous the suit was brushed walked through the door and the guy just went like that uh, I thought, what's he doing and he said uh, those shoes are a disgrace <laughs> you need to go out there and give the, get in that toilet and get them shoes cleaned and he was on the one hand you know doing that humorously but on the other hand he was absolutely spot on you know, your attention to detail has to be encompassing. It has to cover everything. There's no point doing six things and then dropping the seventh if there's seven things that you need to do. So, you know, attention to detail, be the best at what you are, um, and, and, you know, um, and, and which then will start to set you apart. So I'm, I'm not saying let's start to be different. You know, that I think comes on down the line. 
the question was, what do you do when you start early in your career? Just just be the best at what, what you do because there'll be people around you and if you're better than them, then that's when you start to get noticed. Yeah. Um, I think I think the second thing, and this is this is a this is a tough one for a young person, but again, I think you here are um, demonstrating the power of it, and that is network. You know, you've really got to start to network with people, and and again, that's not artificially networking. That's not getting in touch with people for the sake of it when you've got nothing to say. Um, or, you know, uh, drooling over people when you get into a conversation. I'm not saying anything like that, but but moments come when you meet people of, of influence or significance within your career, and they, and they come on a pretty regular basis. And again, it, it's important that you, again, you know, you listen to that person, you understand what they're about, what their motivations are, you connect, but then you stay in touch and you keep in touch. And again, you find you know, appropriate uh, conversations and, and things to do to, to, to stay sort of network with that, that person. Um, and, and again, don't think, you know, again, it's an A to B conversation. You know, if I have a network, if I have a conversation with this person, I really get on and he works for Google, then I'll be getting a job at Google. You know, don't think that way. But, but what happened to me, again, just going back to that analogy of the service station was, you know, we had a vendor, a uh, partner manager that used to come and, you know, we got on really well with him. I got on really well with him. We talked a lot. And of course, the guy who um, had, had offered me the job in the service station, he'd phoned up this guy and said, listen, I need to find some really good people. Who do you know? And he said, you need to call Adam. And it was that relationship and the conversations that then go on that you don't know happen. That's where the benefit of your networking really comes to fruition. And unfortunately, with the third uh, the third point, Carla, I'm going to be incredibly predictable, but unfortunately, there's no two ways around uh, this. It's work hard. You have no, no other route to success, in my opinion. Um, even geniuses, you know, even, uh, you know, people that you see on the TV as celebrities and you think, crikey, you know, all they do is they drag themselves out of bed in the middle of the morning, waltz into a TV studio for an hour, and then, you know, jobs are good and they pick up the million pound check at the end of the day. That's absolutely not how it works. The people who are successful in life are the people who work the, the hardest. It's as simple as that. Now, again, if I go back to being the best, you know, if you're in a team of five or 10 or whatever that may be, um, you know, and again, it's, it's the old, if I relate back to football, sorry, for any ladies who aren't football orientated or anything of that nature but you know it's the, it's it's the it's the guy or gal who stays after training and does the extra shooting practice it's the you know as ian wright used to say you know the more i practice the luckier luckier i get um and, and that is so true you know the person who's in half an hour before everybody else the person who stays half an hour after everybody and just works that little bit harder they're the people that get the breaks the luck the things that happen for them um, and, and so, so they're the three things that I'd say. Um, and, and again, you know, things evolve. Um, don't, uh, I mean, those adages for me will stay with you throughout the whole of your career, but other things may become more prevalent uh, as you get more experienced and, and longer in the tooth in what you do. Yeah, I definitely agree that attitude is the number one thing, right? Work ethic, attitude, just attitude yeah. in general. If, you, if you're you going for a job interview and and your attitude comes across as that you're the guy that's going to get things done. You're going to be working hard. You're going to be delivering against the, the outcomes and the things that you're setting as an expectation to that employer or whatever it might be. Then you're more likely to get that job, even if you're slightly less qualified or not as technically astute in my world as compared to the person that was in before you, but they had an absolute Correct. awful attitude. Correct. Because you can teach those other things, whereas the attitude is generally embedded in someone and ingrained that much that you can't change it. It's an absolute nail on the head. Nail on the head, uh, Kyle. You can teach some things. There are other things that you cannot. And if they're not fundamentally enshrined in the person or the individual, they will never be there. Um, but that's, you know, that's the route to success. It, it, you know, hard work is as simple as, and I'm sorry to be boring and predictable. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. So in, in the career, right, there's generally situations where, where people get a lot of pressure and duress and stress potentially, right? And you may get to that point where you sit there and go, right, you know what, I quit. But then hopefully a lot of people sit there and then take a step back and then overcome it, whether that's through sitting down and having a conversation with someone or whether that's just going out and having a drink and calming down, whatever it might be. 
have you ever got to the point in your career where you thought, right, that's it, hats in, I'm done. And then you've actually sat down and rethought about it and decided not to follow through with that action? Absolutely. Yeah, very, very definitely. Um, you know, again, um, I think uh, successful teams, um, as I was saying before, in respect of, you know, what were the momentum we created intrinsic, it takes its emotional and physical toll. You know, if you are working hard, if you are being successful um, and, you know, with success um, comes the benefits of success. You know, you start to earn significant amount of money. So guess what? You start to party hard. So you party hard, you work hard, you party hard. You know, these things take toll. They, they take a toll on you, um, as I say, in, 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 in two respects, both emotional and um, and physical. Um, now, when we got to the end of that journey, you know, it, it it, it was, it's almost like a death in the family. You know, you've lost a part um, of you as a person. And and the, the back to that uh, statement I made before about teams, you know, that camaraderie that you, you developed through that intense period, you know, stays through thick and thin. You know, if we go back to, um, uh, again, the war, or, you know, we always say, well, the youth of today need some discipline, send them off to the army. The, the, the sort of, the, the, the higher level point of that is is that teamwork, you know, the armed forces or or organizations like that, you know, they, they engender that teamwork and bond, you know, band of brothers, you know, I would put my life on the line for, for this person here, yeah? Well, obviously in work, you know, your life isn't on the line, but it's the same mentality, right? You know, you're working with people through through thick and thin. Mm. So when things do come to an end or they, they start to fail, you know, it, you can start to feel like you've lost someone. You know, it's like a grieving process. And, and then it does take an enormous amount of soul searching or, you know, your reflection to really work out why you're feeling this way. Because actually, I haven't lost somebody in my family or no one's died. But you realize that actually this... This this thing that is is work and the culture and the 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 the, the, the team mentality that you have that's actually like a living being, and, and and that's gone. Of course, the answer to this is 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 in the problem in that. Well, how do you pull yourself back around? How do you get yourself back on an even keel? It's the team and it's the band of brothers or sisters that you've you've worked with that you then get back around and start to talk to and start to really. Um, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, neutralize that negativity in, in your brain and start to remember the really good things and how and why you created what you created. You know, these are the people that can help you through through that um, through, through that period. And you know, I have to say, Carl, um, I've I've spoken over the last uh, six to what would it be now nine months. Um, to many ex-colleagues um, who are really finding this period of time difficult, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, they're either suffering in silence because we're all at home. They maybe don't feel they can have conversations with the family like as they can with the colleagues. Yeah. Um, so they're really carrying some big crosses, you know, that that are weighing heavily on people. And uh, you know, I found myself having um, uh, you know, fairly emotional, but but sort of. Uh, supporting ex-colleagues, you know, through mental hardship, which this period's um, period's put upon all of us. And and it is back to that, you know, band of brothers and team, you know, having worked with these people through the good times and and know what they're like as individuals, you know, to see them in that way, um, as well as feel that way yourself, you know, you want to do something about it and, you you know, you, you feel as if you have that that um, uh, you know desire to, to to work and help with them. Yeah, definitely. And I think on on that whole kind of mental well being within the current situation that we're in, it's very easy for people to overlook the the things that aren't said and yeah. the, the people suffering in silence. And it's like um, I know that a lot of employers have come out and said that they're going to be closing offices, um, which will save them a lot of money operationally, right? Um, but then. How do they, have they actually done an assessment on their employees to find out whether they've actually got working space at home? Has their duty of care extended from the office to their home with the right desk set up and the monitor height, the keyboard, the backrests and whatever else that might be needed? Is it now also that they're not on a bed or hunched over a laptop screen, sat on a chair in the living space because they haven't got a desk and all those kind of things, right? I know that 
for a lot of people, this situation may sound like a great idea. Fantastic, you're working from home. At least you're being able to work, unlike some people. But what are the repercussions on people's health and well-being, physically and mentally, yeah. when, when they've been doing this for an extended period of time? I, I completely agree. And, and, and again, you, you know, whether I'm a traditionalist or not, I don't, I, I don't apologize for saying this. You know, as far as I'm concerned, that one of the best things about being a human being is interaction with with other humans. You know, that goes from, uh, you know, making love, having fantastic relationships with wife and family and children, but it goes all the way through to work. You know, you you have a relationship and a bond with those people around you that that is it's what life's all about. And as great as this technology is, and, I, and obviously I've been in this you see kind of technology for a very long time, um, it can never replace the human need to interact in, you know, with, with, with other humans. So, um, of course, things will be different, uh, definitely. Um, but I do think we all need at some point to get back to, to being with each other. Because yeah. That's what we do best. Yeah, definitely. And kind of like an off-the-cuff question, right? So if you, if you were someone looking to come into technical sales within the industry yeah what what would you say to them what were the 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 the, the uh skills or the things they should be developing um the approaches they should be taking what, what would you be saying to them if they were looking to take a career in technical sales yeah I, funnily enough i've had this conversation this morning I, I i think there are two things to be successful as a salesperson or two headlines let's call it number one is passion um in, in that you, um, you know, you have to believe in, in what it is that you're selling or, or talking to a customer about. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and, and that isn't because of the words that come out of your mouth. It's not what you say. It's the way that you say it. Yeah. And if you're passionate about something, you fundamentally believe, believe in it people pick up on that back to what we were just talking about before you know humans are very instinctive in terms of that in emotional intelligence when you're physically in the room or when you're on a, a bridge even on a bridge like this they need to see that you are passionate because it emanates from you it's not what you say it's how you say it and i think i think the second thing then is is whether this is one or two words it is you have to be genuine and you have to be trustworthy so again um, that isn't about, you know, making claims that you can never, um, you can never deliver on. And of course, for generations, IT has always been about the slide words, vision, the next, you know, what's coming on the roadmap. And, and, and I know uh, people continue to talk about that. Um, and indeed, people want to see that, you know, it's important that I've got, I'm buying in something, something with longevity. But of the old adage, you know, for me, people buy from people and they want someone who's passionate about it, but they can trust that it's going to go on and deliver what they say they're going to deliver. And, mm -hmm. and, and that is, again, relatively simple, sometimes hard to do, it would seem, because a lot of people don't do it. Um, but, um, but that's, for me, what makes a difference. So to people coming into technical sales, what, how do I do that? The first thing is you need to understand your proposition, you know, well enough to be able to confidently articulate it. Yeah. And, and that's not just, pro that isn't just a product. I'm not talking about a product. I'm talking about your company, your, your capability, your delivery capability, or, you know, what, what it is that you execute you, you, your service suite. These are the most important things you need to understand what it is that your, your organization does to then be able to confidently articulate that with passion, not read it off a script, not mm. verbatim. But if you're asked, an, you know, certainly if you're ob handling objections, for example, from a customer, you really don't know what that objection is going to be. But if you can answer it really confidently with articulation and passion, then people, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I can see this person really, you know, really knows what they're talking about. Um, but of course, the way to build build trust and, and, and genuine is you've got to understand your customer. You've got to listen to them. You've got to research them. You've got to understand where they fit, what they do, what the organization does, you know, what motivates it, what motivates that person. Because again, you are then talking to them on their wavelength in a language that they can understand. 
So you might be the most articulate and passionate person in the world, but if you're speaking French and they want to hear German, you, they're not going to understand you. So you have to be able to understand and take the time. And the key word there is, is preparation. Mm -hmm. Just prepare, get the basics, prepare, and then you can build that, that, that trust in terms of you understand what the customer's about, you've listened, you, you, you found things out that, that they maybe won't expect you to know, um, and, and then you come across as a genuine person. I, I think that's a similar, I mean, that, that worked for me. Um, and, and again, all the successful salespeople, again, I did a presentation a few months ago about, you know, um, what makes a successful salesperson. And I thought about all the salespeople throughout my career that I've, I've been with or worked with or, or managed. And, and, I, and, I, and I, the four, I, I got to the four best people um, and it was amazing. While they were very, very different people uh, as individuals, um, they had incredibly similar traits. You know, if you, you know, sort of different that way, but actually this, the same that way. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, and, and, and those two things came out in abundance, you know, passion and, and, and trustworthiness. Perfect. And if we think about the industry, right? So a lot's changed since, since you started out. What would you say was the yeah. biggest change that you've seen and the impact it had on the industry? Um, I guess the, the, the biggest change, um, I mean, the, 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 it's funny, isn't it? For an industry that changes um, so rapidly, you know, in terms of technology changes and, and turns so rapidly. Um, in, in reality, it, 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 it's, it doesn't feel as if um, sometimes things change at all. You know, so if I'm selling a, you know, an analog telephone system and then a digital telephone system and then, you know, um, an IP telephony system, and then maybe it's a mobile phone system, and then it's a hosted voice system that you know can be, you know, on a PC or phone, or whatever. Fundamentally, across all of that, it's about a person having a conversation with another person and being accessible, right? Yeah. So, you still have to understand, you know, what's the importance of that telephone conversation? Well, is it just, well, I, you know, if you can get hold of me, that's great. Is it business critical? You know, I need to be accessible, you know, nine till five. Is it 24 seven, you know, I can't afford to miss this phone call because it's a VIP or actually is it a 999 emergency call handling situation where there's life or death, right? So there are different variants of, of, of that telephone call that you, you need to understand. The technology can change, but it's about that telephone call that, that's important, understanding what the customer, customer wants. Yeah. Um, that um that, that stayed the same and and um and therefore it, 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 it's two different things that um that sort of collide the, the the one thing i would say you know to to maybe spark some debate is um if we look at this uh covid situation right so um what is that going to do to the future of it so i think if we if we look over the last five years um you could stay a lot longer than that you know um, certainly MSPs and obviously people like that, you know, what we've been trying to do is um, generate things as a service, yeah? And of course, along has come this thing called the cloud and, you know, uh, pay-as-you-go consumption-based models, right? Now, on the one hand, you know, uh, what COVID has done has demonstrate the benefit of that business model, right? So, no one had uh, in abundance, you know, the access to these kind of platforms, um, let's say 10 months ago. I mean, of course, they've been around for a very, very long time, but, but, but the human side of us chose to do things differently. Um, but of course, you know, eight, eight months ago, everybody jumped onto these platforms, including my wife is a great example, and now she cannot see a future without it, you know. Wow, this technology is fantastic. Well, it's been around for 20 years, love. Why have you not been using it before? But of course, you know, COVID has, has really forced people and organizations to use technology uh, differently. And therefore, you know, it's the biggest advert for sort of consumption and OPEX based revenue that you could possibly um, create. Um, however, um, the flip side of that is, of course, um, if we go back prior to OPEX into CAPEX, 
um, you know, and business models that were out there, if there was a downturn in the economy, then what people did was they ceased capex. They didn't make the spend. They kept the money in the bank, rode through the choppy waters. Then off we went and we spent capex again, right? And what we've seen in uh, COVID is revenue, you know, through the front door just evaporate overnight, you know, uh, and or at the very best, um, be at a very, very low level compared to where it was prior to COVID for most businesses. Now, if you built a business model that's, that's sort of uh, anchored in OPEX, but your OPEX has dried up, then that creates a massive problem for the business uh, because you've got fixed costs, you know, that you, you, you've escalated uh, to, to a point that you now can't meet. And of course, you can't always switch the tap off straight away. So um, it does feel to me uh, in a lot of conversations that I've had with a number of businesses that actually maintaining that control of cash through uh, funding um, sort of departmental spend via CapEx as opposed to OpEx is actually returning into people's psyche um, a little bit more because of what's sort of um, happening with the front of the business in terms of how OPEX into the business is, is drying up. So it'll be interesting to see how that um, pans out uh, in the next period. Um, you know, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, pay as you go isn't always pay as you go, is it really? There's, there's a retainer and an OPEX and, um, and, 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 you know, people, are, 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 you know, can't influence influence things if they've signed to these contracts. So I think that's going to be very interesting to see how that pans out in the in the next period. Yeah, and I, I know customers that have come and I've had conversations with where they've asked the question of, can you work with me and my finance department to understand how we can capitalize cloud? Yeah. Right? Because we don't yeah. want to operationally pay for it. Mm. And it's like, well, that kind of negates some of the value of cloud if you do it that way, but there is ways and means of doing it. It just yep. means that the reason why you're probably put in there isn't probably the right reason. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But, uh, those those conversations are and have been a bit of a topic for the last 12, 18 months for me specifically, um, po during yep. and before this this current pandemic that we're in. Um, yeah. So uh, sorry, it's just just to sort of um, the, I guess the point I'm, I'm I was saying in going through all that was that if your question was what what do you think's changed. I think the the, the, the the mechanism of delivery has, has changed tenfold in the time that I've been here. I, th I think the basics of of what you're trying to achieve, which is, you know, uh, provide a productivity enhancement or an increased customer service through the use of technology. I don't think that dynamics changed at all in all the time um, that I've been here. The, I guess, therefore, probably the biggest change that I, I really have seen is how, um, you know, technology is funded and paid for and, and mm. the consumption of it um, that has probably um, through those years that I've been in this game been the biggest change and, and again I think that's far from a finished uh, sort of uh, 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 question at the minute I think that will roll on certainly with the, the current new norm <laughs> yeah whatever that norm is mm. and um, on that new norm or current norm um, with the, the pandemic situation we're in, that's obviously having positive and negative impacts on individuals and organizations. Yeah. From what you're seeing, what would you say is the, the a common positive and negative that you're seeing? Again, going back to the theme, I guess, which we've talked on a few times, which is teams, is that we're all in it together. You know, I think there's a very definite, uh, whether it's a British thing, you know, whether it's a kind of a dunker spirit, whatever you want to call it. I, th I think we as a we as a nation, and I, I probably I, I would suggest it's worldwide, but um, I, I, I get the feeling that everybody, for the first time, is starting to appreciate everybody else's uh, hardships and difficulties and challenges. I don't think there's a family in the UK that isn't hasn't got a challenge of some respect, um, and therefore, you know, what you're seeing is the best of of humans, isn't it? In terms of we're we're working together both in a personal um, perspective but equally in a professional capacity to to help each other and and there are i mean i see examples of that 10 times every day so I, you know i really do think um that has been a, a massive 
positive I, I really do community spirit is actually returning in in in, in the world um and, and it's not i don't think that it's disappeared i think we've all got so busy that we've we've just forgot about community and then when we actually have taken a collective breath we go you know, hang on this community thing this is really good i know I'm, I'm going back into this and actually i'm going to stay in it this time i'm not i'm not going to allow myself to um to be pulled out of it so, so that's an overwhelming positive and again i think just just going back to what we've said before i think i think the negative is you know we, we've 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 lost that um integration and, and and working with each other you know office banter you know it's it's so much more difficult to have office banter across um an email or or a virtual bridge you know you just don't get the body language the jokes don't quite interpret themselves the same um you know and and and, and again let's be honest um who doesn't like going down the pub and having you know 10 pints after work to celebrate we all love that part of you know this industry the best thing about this industry is the you know the, the the social side the collective success the celebrations that we have and you know having lost that as we have um over these last few months that's been a real uh, real blow because you, it feels like we're all working really hard um and doing all the things you know in a different way we're all working hard but we always worked hard um but what we did get for that uh, hard work was the rewards and it feels like we've not we've not received those uh, in the way that we used to um so that's i would say is the negative yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree on that statement. I think the things that I've been saying to my team is just like when when this is all blown over and we can actually do something to to celebrate our successes in a in a meaningful way, not on a, a virtual cooking night or a crystal maze thing online yeah. we can do as a group, but something actual, actually together. Um, and then going yeah. celebrate it properly. And I think that's something that I think a lot of people are missing and want to do once once this is uh, allowing us to do so. If we think about couldn't agree more. Yeah, if you think about technology and um, and obviously you, you've seen various parts of the industry uh, over the years. What technology or area of the industry is, is piquing your interest at the minute? Yeah, it's a really good question. Really, really good question. Um, and I'm I'm gonna say automation. Um, I'm I'm really, really interested in automation at the moment. You know, um, whether it's artificial intelligence, you know, robotic automation. Um, I, 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 you know, I, you're a more technical orientated person than, than I am. But at the end of the day, in, in, if you line up a thousand people on the street, you know, I am a techie nerd. You know, I love technology. I fundamentally believe technology has changed this world. You know, there are absolutely some examples where it's changed it for the worse, but, you know, overwhelmingly it's changed it for the better. You know, the way it's transformed all of our lives is, is incredible. And we're only at the beginning of it. You know, we are, it will continue to incredibly change our lives. Now, I think if, um, if I look at um, the dynamic that we're currently in, um, you, you know, um, if we look at the if we look at the chancellor's um, pockets, you know, and the cost uh, for, um, you know, if, if companies, individuals, salaries, all these things are all under massive pressure. The one thing underpinning that is is obviously the chancellor's uh, chancellor's pocket, the World Bank, all these you know government organisations. Yeah. You know, th there is going to come a time where we need to pay money back, where uh, um, you know sort of isn't what it, it, it was we, we, you know there's recession there's hardship that that's as far as I'm concerned I think it's an inevitability and we're in the middle of it you know as we speak H how do we move forward how do we get out of that it isn't about you know not spending not doing things it's about productivity it's always about productivity it's about doing things more efficient and better than we used to do them before so we you know we'll still want to do more we'll still want to get out we'll still want to do all these things consumed by all these things i absolutely think we'll get back to that but we we need to drive cost down we need to make things more productive and i am convinced that automation um which is obviously a very very fledgling technology and again still to a lot of people you know they fear it you know it, it, again as is often the case with technology it's builders technology is going to steal my job you know machines are going to come along and, and do what i did you know 
hogwash, we all know it's absolute rubbish. You know, what machines do or, or technology does is it comes along and does the mundane things that yeah. humans no longer want to do because we've moved on. You know, we're doing the next thing. And, that, and, and that's where, of course, it, it can go way beyond that, but that's where automation drives massive value straight away. So I really, really do believe that that's, that's an area that's really, really interesting at the moment. Um, yeah. I suppose on the end of that, to, to an extent as well, is is also IoT and and you know, the way <clears throat> the way that we're collecting the data for then automation to make those decisions. Um, uh, you know, I think the devices, the I mean, again, if you look at the home, you know, the 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 the, uh, the home tech that's coming along and the way that we can start to um, uh, access uh, information. Um, to then process again, I think that that is exciting as well. It really, really is. But no, it, it, it's um, it, it, automation is definitely something I'm really spending a lot of time at the moment. Yeah, it's it's, it's a definite area that I think everyone should uh, go and have a look into for sure. And especially even if you're just a standard infrastructure guy that just looks after as a sysadmin or whatever, make your life easier, right? You can go and learn something new and pivot a little bit while that's doing its job for you. There's yep. lots of things that people could be doing with with automation and. I think that I think the biggest challenge is that that cultural aspect of it, you're taking my job away from me. It's that same conversation we had with the data center team when we virtualized it or we booked exactly. it in the cloud. It's looking at what now your job would look like moving forward. Because if you're not willing to embrace it now, in five years' time, someone's going to enforce you to embrace it and you'll be at the back of the queue. So you might as well get on with it now. Correct. But but again, um, COVID aside, um, and, and again, this, this, I am not talking about levels of unemployment, but levels of employment continue to go up and up and up. We are employing more people than we've ever employed, yet we are using more automation than we've ever used. So it's it's, it's not like you know employment's r plummeting and all of a sudden uh, there are you know exponential amount of people unemployed because there's a fleet of super robots doing doing people's work. It, you know it, it just doesn't. It is a it is a complete mis misnomer, um, and and again, you know, um, people are, as we said right back at the beginning beginning of our conversation around, you know, this current scenario we're in. P people are resilient, they are adaptive, they're intuitive. You know, if I if all of a sudden the job that I did is taken away, what do you do? Do you give up? Do you just stop? No, people don't do that. People work out how to move on and move forward. Um, you know, machines as it stands, and I'm sure it'll change one day. They don't do that. You know, they do to a certain degree what we tell them, and then they can learn around the outside of that. Our complexity and capability, you know, wow. as, a, as a species, is incredible. So you, you can't fear it. So let's go on to some like miscellaneous questions, right? So these like quick fire round, lightning round kind of questions, just to get yep. people to get to know a bit more about yourself. So, what was your last technology purchase? Uh, last technology purchase. Um, well, again, I've got, I've, I've got to go back to the Alexa, haven't I? So I've just been. Uh, I, I, I tell you what, I, I, I am again, but you know, uh, this is the, the 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 feature of that journey. You know, I mean, I have um, I have the uh, the turn two turntables downstairs. Um, I've got the mixer desk, and I've got the I've got the vinyl. So um, you know, music's a big part of my life. It always has been. Uh, you know, I've got thousands of CDs. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm now you know firmly in the, uh, in the Spotify um, <laughs> camp and uh, again I forget his name in a minute genius it's genius on uh, on Apple Music so so I think um, you know before everything was on demand you know uh, you back to show my age here Kyle you know you used to a, a good dj you know you had a good dj and the point of a good dj was they would mix um and connect songs together yeah so <clears throat> you know you'd play a song by an artist and then you'd play five six ten other songs that were sort of connected and you know you you hooked into that dj because you like that style of music um and, and again music is an infinite you know uh subject because you don't know what you don't know and you know there's a million songs that arrive every day um, so how do you know which ones to listen to? Um, now, again, I think the um, the way that the tech is connecting artists, as I say, genius playlists and things like that on Spotify, you know, I absolutely love that. I've loved that for, for a few years. And of course, um, I'm, I'm now at the point of, of flooding 
um, uh, Sonos and and, and, and and integrated Alexa, Amazon Music, Apple Music and Spotify around the house. Um, and, and again, uh, you know, creating uh, or using the technology to create playlists that then, you know, kick out tracks that you think, wow, that's fantastic. I've never heard that song. I've never heard that artist. And, and again, I still get a massive thrill. I remember going down to the, you know, listen on the radio. I even used to read the M Enemy, and you'd hear you'd hear a song. You'd go and buy the album, and you'd, you'd find that album track. And it, and that moment when you found an album track that you loved, it was tremendous. Well, of course, you can do that on steroids now. But when you still get that buzz when you hear a track by an artist that you've never heard before. So, you know, I'm really using the tech in that that way at the minute. I've not, you know, other than sort of integrating and using the Alexa to to drive it. So I haven't really, I'm, it's kind of not necessarily I'm, I've bought anything, but I'm using that and really enjoying it. Yeah, no, and I am I love Spotify and, and just finding new artists. And back, I, I love playing the guitar, right? And finding new bands that are from random countries and random locations Correct. that are linked to the Absolutely. same genre or type or melody that goes into it using the same chords or whatever. And it's like, it's brilliant. Because I, 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 there's um, a band that, uh, kit that I found the other day and it's I think the name is Polyphia and they released a song called Go earlier this year and it's from a guitar player's thing it's an amazing song it's yeah, not everyone's yeah, cup of tea yeah, I'll yeah. be honest but I wouldn't have found it if it wasn't for Spotify I would Correct. never have found it I would yeah. never have found it without that yeah um, yeah 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 that's brilliant so if we think about inspiration who, who's your biggest inspiration I, I that, that's an easy one um Anybody who's worked with me will know this, but um, the, the the person that I have always been in awe of is is Sir Winston. Um, it's got to be a, a relatively well used, and again, sort of cliched uh, uh, choice, uh, particularly for I guess a male of of my age. But I think um, I, th I think uh, what he was able to achieve by the words that he spoke in the way that he spoke them, you know is one of the most incredible human achievements of all time. You know, in, in our lifetime, you know, some of the things we've just talked about, um, what the way that we live, you know, the uh, the luxuries that we have is uh, compared to sort of that world that he uh, grew up in and the hardship of war, we cannot comprehend. We just cannot comprehend it. And, you know, for him to have influenced people in the way that he did by the power of his voice and his his choice of words it is always had me in awe i've always been in awe of that um so it would be uh so winston yeah 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 it's a good one and what is it work-life balance means to you which again crikey mate um <laughs> simple answer to that is i've never had one i've never had <laughs> one um this is the first time i've ever had one um so again it, you know it is a real inflection slash reflection point um, you know, all through my life, I've, I've missed everything, you know, uh, of course I, I have been to children's, uh, plays at, 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 uh, at school or, you know, you, you, the, the, the opening the presents in the morning, of course I've, I, I've done all that, but I've missed so many of them. You it must, have, this must've happened to other people, but you get to a point where you actually feel you're a passenger in your own life. Mm. You know, you, you you know you're at the train station, but the train's gone. Um, so um, having this work-life balance that we've got now, um, it, it's it's completely different. And again, and, you know, it took some adjusting. It didn't just happen overnight. And you think, oh great, um, it was quite difficult. You know, there are things that you have to work through and and and, and do differently. But um, but yeah, no, it's uh, it's. Uh, I think the answer to the question is, I actually really like a work-life balance and I've now got one, but I've never had one before. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great answer though, right? Because like, you don't know what you're missing until you you miss it, right? So it's, it's an Yeah. Issue. And there will be so many people, mate, again, in this industry, so many people in that, that same situation. Um, and beyond our industry, I guess, as well. But uh, uh, again, I think we've all rediscovered the, the important things in life, haven't we? It's fair to say. Yeah, definitely. And what did you what did you want to do when you finished school? So everything like yeah, school, great so question. What did you want to be? 
I, I've only ever been wanted to be one thing in my life in terms of uh, what I wanted to be, and that was a pilot. I wanted to be a pilot, um, and I joined uh, as a 15-year-old lad. I joined the. Uh, I have to get this right now. I think it's the. Is it the OT ATC? Sorry, the Air ATC, the Air Training Corps. Yeah. Um, which was the so, uh, Air Force cadets. Um, and again, I may have been younger than 15, but I was, you know, uh, I thought, well, that's a way to sort of get into flying things. Um, and it was, and I was, you know, really passionate about it. Flight is something that's, that's always uh, intrigued me. It's incredible flight, um, obviously particularly out of the atmosphere, but um that's something I want to do, but quite quickly. Um, uh, and I, and I, although I've got glasses on now, that, that's largely because I need them for reading. My eyesight's always been first class, so I, I, I don't know why. But uh, quite early on, I, f I failed a uh, an eye test, um, and and you know, I think you, maybe you have to have twenty twenty vision. Or maybe at the point at that point, mine was even better. You know, it was like twenty two twenty two because I, you know I had really good eyes but it wasn't 2020 and that created a uh, a problem and I failed the eye test so quite quickly that was taken away and um you know by the age of say 16 I knew it just wasn't that wasn't going to be something that that um that I did so so at that point after that I never really um thought about um what, what I would do for a career mm. um but I, I I think since from day one absolutely day, day one of becoming a salesperson it, it's been a job that I've I've loved ever since and and I wouldn't change it uh for anything um I might change it to be a professional golfer and follow the sun you know uh 12 months a year but other than that um I, I I just wouldn't I wouldn't change it because you know the the again the relationships the experiences the friendships that it's brought for me uh, um it, it, you know has, has given me an incredibly rewarding time um so yeah that, that, yeah pilot yeah definitely i think i just say just started playing golf from 12 months in i'm still finding my feet let's put it that way <laughs> well again, again golf is uh back, back, back to a little bit of the thing we've been going for golf's golf's just the mechanism with which i deliver um uh, a time with my friends and a bit of a competitive edge you know, I played football, competitive football for 33 years and I absolutely loved every single day and every single game. Um, and it, again, win, lo win, lose or draw, it wasn't about that. It was, it was again, it was the camaraderie, but also it was the competition. It was the scrap, the fight, you know, um, and, and the physical e exertion, all of that. I absolutely loved it. Now I've had to stop doing that. Um, you know, it, 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 it's not the football that I miss. Um, I do, obviously. Um, but it's it's that camaraderie, it's the changing room, it's the five, ten, fifteen pints afterwards, whatever it may be. That's the bit that's gone. So I've I've sort of recently got much more into golf because it, in a lesser way, no, not the same because at best there's only four of you. Um, albeit again, I'm you know, of course, COVID's killed it, but I was a, I am a member of a club, and you get to know a wider, wider audience. Um, it, it, it keeps that competitive and, and camaraderie going. So so that's why I play golf. Matt, no, um, we could probably call this a quit. So thank you very much for your time, mate. It's been much appreciated. Yeah, no, it's been a pleasure. And it's, um, I just want to say what I said at the start, I think it's a great initiative, Kyle. It's um, a great um, opportunity to pass on, as I say, lessons learned, wisdom. And if you or anybody else, you know, wants to have a follow-up conversation with me, they're very, very welcome to do so. Perfect. Thanks, mate. Yeah.